evening. Good evening. So, if you're hot, can we apologize for that? No, go ahead. You have to stand over by this door over there, and that's what we're going to do. But we're here to talk a little bit about flood mitigation in terms of HUD funding. And so I have these notes I need to talk about, but I'm not going to really look at them. So, it's just my MO. So, what we're here to talk about is the federal grant from HUD, and what we call the Community Development Block Grant Mitigation Fund. Who are you? And, and I am Steve Costello, thank you. I am the Parker Recovery Officer, Chief Parker Recovery Officer. Yeah, I'm right. Do I need to talk louder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I normally don't use these things. So, uh, yes, my name is Stephen Costello. I'm on the Mayor's staff. I'm the Chief Recovery Officer for Harvard. And prior to that, when I joined his staff, he would call me the flood czar. So I'm really a flooding and drainage person. And so what we're here today is to talk a little bit about the funding that we have from HUD for what we call flood mitigation associated with our A little bit of history. Back in February of 2018, the federal government had allocated about $4.3 billion to the state of Texas for what they call flood mitigation to HUD, from HUD to GLO which is the state agency where all the money flows through. They also had a direct allocation to the city of Houston for $61 million. Now, what's happening right now is, is that the state is in the process of preparing what they call the state action plan for their $4.3 billion. And that plan will come out, we're hearing either Thursday or Friday of this week, available for public comment about a 45-day period before it's actually submitted to HUD. We would encourage everyone to look at that plan on behalf of the city because we would like to maximize how much money we would get to the city. So we want you all to look at that. But the purpose of this meeting is the first public hearing with the direct allocation that we got. And we have to prepare what's called a local action plan as well. So what we're going to discuss today is how or what we would like to do is spend the $61 million in direct allocation. And it's really an exchange. What we're going to do is we're going to highlight parts of our plan, what we have to address in the local Parts. action plan, which will be due in HUD sometime in March of next year. But we're going to ask your input on where you think we should be spending the money. So this is an exchange. It's really what it's all about. Then. So we're going to have a short presentation by several people, one from housing, one from the Office of Emergency Management, then back to housing. And then there will be some discussion groups to talk about what your thoughts on how we spend the money. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. I want to introduce Councilmember Cisneros, who is here today. Thank you, Councilmember. Is there, is there anyone else in the here of elected officials? Yes, sir, representing Sheila Jackson Lee's office. Thank you. Name, sir? Larry Freeman. Larry Freeman. So, uh, in the interest of time and the fact that we're really, really hot, so I want to get it going real quick. So, Mary, you want to start this off? Good evening, my name is Mary Itz. Um, I'm the principal planner at the City of Houston's Housing and Community Development Department. As, as Steve mentioned, uh, the City of Houston has been allocated $61 million of Community Development Block Grant Mitigation Funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. <coughs> Resulting from the disasters occurring in 2015, 2016, 2017, Congress appropriated mitigation funds to cities and states impacted by these disasters. This has resulted in a new HUD grant called CDBG MIT, CDBG Mitigation. The City of Houston will receive CDBG MIT funds because the city received a direct allocation of CDBG disaster recovery funds from HUD for 2015 flood events, the Memorial Day flood and the Halloween flood. Unlike CDBG disaster recovery funds that were intended to address impacts from a particular disaster event, these mitigation funds don't have to tie back to one disaster event and instead are intended to reduce the risk of future disasters. 
to receive these funds, the city must submit an action plan to HUD by March 3rd. And uh, thank you for being here tonight to help us gather information to develop our action plan. In August, the rules for CPG mitigation funding were published in the Federal Register Notice. The, the state of Texas, as Steve mentioned, also um, received an allocation of CPG MIT funds that we'll discuss a little bit in depth later in the presentation. Um, tonight is our first of two public hearings for the, this funding. Um, currently, we're developing the action plan. The draft action plan will be available for public comment um, for a 45-day public comment period in December. And after the public comment period, we'll incorporate the comments and finalize the plan to um, ask for city council approval and submit it to HUD before the March 3rd deadline. CDBG mitigation funds have similar rules and align closely to other CDBG regulations. The mitigation funds must prioritize the protection of low and moderate income residents. HUD requires that at least 50% of the mitigation funds benefit low and moderate income people or neighborhoods. Also, HUD requires that a portion of the funds be spent in areas that HUD has identified as most impacted and distressed. The entire city of Houston is a mid most impacted and distressed area. We're required to spend all the funds within 12 years and at least 50% of the funds within the, in the first six years. HUD has worked closely with FEMA to develop a definition for mitigation activities. HUD defines mitigation activities as those that increase resilience, reduce risk, and limit the impact of future, future disasters. Eligible activities include infrastructure, housing, economic development, and planning activities. So as we mentioned, to apply for these funds, we must submit an action plan to HUD. Unlike previous disaster recovery action plans that included unmet needs analysis, this action plan will include a risk-based mitigation needs assessment. The plan will also discuss local and regional planning and coordination of funds, and also have a budget and an overview of the programs that um, will spend the funding on. Melanie Bardis will, uh, from the Office of Emergency Management will now uh, discuss the mitigation risk assessment. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, everyone. Um, the uh, Office of Emergency Management is pleased to be part of this public hearing. The, uh, the mitigation plan, the City of Houston Hazard Mitigation Action Plan, serves the basis for the risk assessment that's being conducted for this effort, um, as it is required to be from the guidance from the, from the HUD, and, um, and FEMA has worked with them on that. So we're, we are collaborating with the housing department to make sure that our assessment is uh, aligned with our past efforts and looking to the future. Our current and future hazards um, have been assessed in our existing plan, but we, are, um, we, are, we have ranked them for the purposes of this effort. Obviously, flood is, is on top. Um, many of you are here for a, a discussion about flood, but we have also considered other hazards for this per, for this as risk assessment, including hurricane, extreme heat, wind. Um, also down toward the bottom, you'll see dam failure. Now, we dam failure itself as a risk is low. When we wrote this plan originally, it was in, in early 2017. It was prior to Hurricane Harvey, and we are looking at this differently now. We're looking at dam-related risks instead of dam failure, since we have seen that it's not necessarily dam failure that, that's our biggest concern when it comes to dams. It releases um, from those dams um, into our streams and impacting areas that may uh, otherwise not be vulnerable to flood. So let's talk about flood risk, since that's the big reason that we are here today. Um, flooding is obviously the, the hazard to which Houston is most at risk. Um, 
not just not just Houston, but nationally. Nationally, flood risk is, is the highest ranked hazard. Um, flood risk is not static. You'll see on the maps around the room um, that there are flood insurance rate maps, and those things you call the 100-year the floodplain or the 500-year floodplain. Um, this is a, a point in time. It's, 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 it's not something that we, um, we consider when it's, when we're looking at, at flood risk listings. Um, it's a point in time, and flood risk is changing. Um, it changes every day with every structure that's built, with every project that's even this team implement. Flood risk uh, fluctuates, moves up and down. Um, it's different every single day. Flood insurance rate maps are one way to show risk, but it's not the only way to show risk. So we look at that for the purposes of flood insurance, but day to day you'll see things like, um, like Tropical Storm Imelda, where 60% of the, of the homes that were, that were flooded were not in a mass flood plain. So that's one way to account for risk, but it's certainly not the only way. We are looking and working with partners across the local, state, federal, nonprofit, private sector, and academic partners to, to build better flood uh, risk assessments and maps and making sure that we're using the best data available. This map is an example of, of something called repetitive flood losses. This was produced um, by the Public Works Department. Repetitive flood losses are losses of a rolling 10-year period of uh, $1,000 a greater um, uh, two or more times. So uh, these, this, these heat maps, you'll see heat maps are hot spots up in the Kingwood area in the Northwest, along Spring Branch, down in Meyerland, certainly in the area that we're in now. Um, and this is this was even pre-Harvey. Um, if we look at the data now, um, there will be hot spots in, in more areas of the city. So I don't want to necessarily dwell on the on the flood risk maps themselves. Those speak for themselves. If you want more information about these flood risk um, maps, you can go uh, to the flood risk and maps that are available here. You're welcome to bust out your cameras and go there. You can also Google them. But really, if you want to look at other, other data that's that's more updated. You can look at if you want one data. Um, HoustonTX.gov heat maps has, uh, for any given storm, uh, <coughs> you can look at what's flooding now. Um, 311 folds into that. And oh, and you have the uh, preparedness guide. Right. Come on, all of a sudden. Jeez. <laughs> so, then there's also Map Next. Um, that's a Harris County specific project, and they are looking to the future using. Um, high resolution imagery to build out better flood. Maybe it was better when it was off, huh? <laughs> can you give us yeah. can you give us the uh, the um, information that you just shared a moment ago with the um, the various places that we would be able to go as an alternative right quick? Because we could barely hear you. Um, you couldn't hear me. Okay. Yeah. My apologies, I thought this was a lot. The um, so the flood insurance rate maps. Harris County, Montgomery County, and Fort Bend County, those portions of Houston are in all three. Um, it, if you want to take a picture, it's probably the best way to, to look at that. Um, but the 311 data, um, there's uh, the call data that's coming in from 311 about the flood reports. That's available in almost a real time basis as that information is fed into the system. And those heat maps are available. And I can't remember if Marty might be able to speak to this, but it's on a 24 hour basis and then it looks for like a 10 day period. There's different time periods um, that you can look back uh, at, at what those calls were about the 311 data and flood reports. So for a given, for a given event, that's, that's a good place to see what's flooding now. Also, um, transfer maps and the, and the high water locations on there, they have good data real time about what's flooding. So you can't just look at, at where your flood risk is on, this, on these flood maps. Um, again, it's a point in time, it's, it's static data, um, and flood, flood risk is rolling. So, as I said, flood risk is changing. Atlas 14 data, which that might not mean anything to you, but it's basically the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association is doing lots of assessments on, on what is it that we're seeing. We're seeing changes in, in, our, in our weather patterns and our storm risk. So, the one percent annual chance rainfall event. This is for again for a twenty-four hour period um, has risen from twelve point seven inches in that twenty-four hour period to seventeen inches, and then for for a uh, I think it's for the ten-year uh, return interval. That's 
at somewhere around eight inches. So this is significant. This is a significant change, and it's our new normal. And so that's something we consider in our future planning as well. So we're moving on to hurricane. Now, a lot of times in Houston, those, those risks blend together, but um, certainly flood is still a risk with hurricanes. Um, but we also add uh, storm surge, which um, creates some, some different and unique, unique challenges in some of our coastal areas, and, um, and wind risk. Uh, flash flooding and river flooding. And then also, as you look at this map, most of these areas that are vulnerable to storm surge is also our port area. And uh, hazardous materials incidents are concerning that area too. Sea level rise. So now, again, exacerbating the, the flood risk. We have, uh, in the next 80 years, we can see up to 7.28 feet of sea level rise. It won't be as significant, obviously, as it would on the coast, but because we have inlets to the coast um, that will backflow, and we have we have seen some of the reaches interior to Houston um, getting up uh, in, in some of the modeling that we've seen. So it's something to consider as we develop um, infrastructure plans and mitigation plans in the future, and to ensure that we're not just addressing current risk but future risk. Vulnerability assessment. So part of the risk formula is to consider not just the hazard and not just the consequences, but vulnerability. And so we're looking at socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity and language issues. We're looking at uh, housing and transportation access and uh, whether or not individuals with disabilities live in these impact vulnerability. And this is an overall composite view of vulnerability. So one of the things that we're required to do is to assess the risk on these lifelines. So FEMA defines these in a very specific way, and HUD has asked us to apply that. So as we look at the hazards, um, the hazard analysis of the flooding, hurricane, dam-related risk, sea level rise, and other hazards, we're, we're combining that with the consequence, that consequence analysis and then the vulnerability assessment. This is sad. Um, and tying that into the risk um, and assessing all of that together. So we're using this whole composite to build that, that document to support the action plan for the mitigation of this assessment. So as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, just like the city of Houston is receiving mitigation funds, the state of Texas is also receiving mitigation funds. They're receiving it not only for 2015 flood events like we are, but also for 2016 and 2017, including Hurricane Harvey flood events. So they will receive $4.3 billion worth of mitigation funds for the whole state of Texas to do mitigation activities. The city of Houston um, could be eligible to receive some of this funding. Um, we won't know what, what it will be to apply for this funding until after the, the action plan, the state's action plan is out published for public comment. Uh, we expect the action plan, the state's action plan to be out for public comment for 45 days like ours um, between now and December 1st. So by December 1st, the state's action plan will be out for public comment. Um, please go and, and look and, and comment. Um, the city of Houston has been working with Harris County closely, Harris County Engineering, Harris County Flood Control, Harris County Community Services, um, to align different um, mitigation flood projects. Um, so we have asked the Texas General Land Office, who is the administrator of the Texas Mitigation Funds, um, to allow us to add our um, several different watersheds worth of projects into their action plan. Um, so we will continue to work with the Texas General Land Office and Harris County to um, try to bring some of those dollars to Houston. Now we're gonna break out into discussion groups. Um, we, we have heard a lot from uh, the public regarding mitigation, regarding flood loss in the past. Um, last year, 
or last summer we did our local action plan for Hurricane Harvey that was later um, put in with the state's action plan for Hurricane Harvey disaster recovery funds. Um, and we did a, a survey. And from this survey, we heard that the greatest risk, um, the greatest concern of Houstonians was um, flood risk and to mitigate against those risks, um, to create drainage projects, to improve infrastructure. Um, so tonight, we're gonna ask you about um, the risks that concern you the most and about the priorities that you have in your communities. Um, so we'll have um, we'll have a note taker as well as a uh, person to direct the discussion. Um, so if y'all will, uh, if you're at a, a table of two, if you would join another table, um, and we'll have our employees come around and ask you some questions. After that, we'll reconvene and do a public hearing portion. If you signed up or did not sign up for a public hearing um, to make a comment, a three minute comment, uh, you can sign up at where you signed in. Um, and we look forward to hearing what you say. I'd like to apologize also for the heat. We've um, asked the building folks if they could do something about it. Apparently they are unable to control the, the heat in this room from this location. So we apologize. We understand that it's very warm in here. So. Um, we'll have Danielle, uh, or if the other mic works, we'll have Danielle hand off the mics to each of the uh, different people. And each person will be allowed three minutes to speak. Um, as part of that process, we do have some indicators along the way to let you know when you have about a minute left and about 30 seconds left. Um, we're trying to keep it at three minutes where possible to get everybody in tonight. Um, if you have additional public comment beyond uh, speaking or if you choose not to provide a public comment by speaking tonight, there are also these forms on your, page, on your table where you can submit a written comment and we'll take those as well. Uh, just to be clear, it's, this isn't necessarily a question and answer session. Um, if we can answer immediately in the moment, we will. We have a lot of experts in this room uh, from the housing department, from OEM, from public works, uh, from the mayor's office that can help out. So even if in the moment we're not responding to you, we may uh, speak with you right after uh, the public hearing portion uh, so that we can choose to have a response, uh, some type of help, or uh, whatever you may need. So we're going to go ahead and get moving on to our list of names. And if you didn't check yes and you kind of get through this and you decide that you want to do a public comment, you didn't indicate that when you came in, we'll kind of do a last call at the end to make sure everybody that wants to speak has yes. time to speak. Okay. So first up on the list, we have Maria Davila. Maria? Hi, my name is Maria Davila, and I live in District C. It is called Wood Creek uh, Subdivision in Rice Military. Um, there's a small group of us in our neighborhood that have been trying since 2015, maybe 2014, to try to get help in mitigating uh, flood. Um, we've been, um, we've done everything from planning to even drawing out the design, the scope of the work, providing a word doc, we've even provided it to Mr. Costello. We haven't had any success, so um, it's unfortunate that I feel exhausted begging for help for our entire neighborhood. So it impa impacts not just me, it just is not, I'm not here just for me, I'm here for several of our neighbors who have been impacted so much and so many times, um, and you know, they tried helping us for a small portion by digging the ditches a little deeper, um, you know, but again, nothing, nothing has worked. So we've actually done all the homework for the neighbor, you know, for the city of Houston. Uh, as I said, i drawn out the plan. I don't know what else to ask for. So I'll do whatever it takes to get help for us. Um, I've tried begging, pleading, I've harassed, Ellen Cohen's office, um, 
you know, the only thing I don't do is drive by her house, stand on her porch. Uh, but if that's what people say it needs to happen, I, I'm willing to do it. So, as I said, um, several of my neighbors have been impacted so many times. And um, there's days that I can't even get to my house or out of my house simply because at any rain event, uh, we're impacted. It doesn't matter if it rains one inch, two inches, ten inches. We can't even leave the house or come here. Thank you, Marvin. Appreciate it. Uh, Carol Brown. Roger Butler. Uh, 
with you for buying the three alternatives instead of one for more than you could buy. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. So, I wasn't planning on speaking. I'm very happy to be here. I've been here before, and I'm always thankful that this school lets us have the space to have a public discourse. Here's my concern. The city of Houston doesn't have a comprehensive flood plan. So when emergencies happen, they do things, but there's no script. We've had multiple major, almost catastrophic events. This city is built on a swamp. We flood, we get it. But the city and the county both need to have comprehensive flood plans that join together and match up. The city and the county also need, I believe, once a quarter, and they say and they talk and staff says, we meet and we work very well together, but the city and the county need to meet at least once a quarter to put politics aside and go in a room and say, county, you have all of this equipment, you have all of this money, and the city goes, we have all of these projects. And they need to set aside the politics, even though we had a discussion that that's gonna be difficult, to do what's in the best interest of the people, because if they don't, this is an all hands on deck situation. If they don't, two things will happen. You will lose property, and most people here, that's one of your most largest investments is your property. But you will also lose lives. And nobody here wants to be the person that they write the story about. And nobody wants to get a phone call about someone losing their life because they were caught in floodwaters. So this is an all hands on deck situation. And we need to treat it like that. So a comprehensive plan will work. The city and the county doing more things. But they also got to tell the people that are their residents. We're sitting here and people start telling us things that we go, if we didn't attend this meeting, if I didn't have a council member that I saw at my regular civic That's club right. meeting that That's told right. me what they were doing, I'd have to see it in the paper mm -hmm. or I'd have to find out after the fact. What neighborhood you from? Northeast Houston, Cynicwood. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. I ran as a city council candidate. So on all of these issues, I got thousands of questions on what you would do. And I sat in meetings like this. And there are meetings that you guys don't even know, yeah. that people sit in and make decisions for you. That's the way it is, and I get it. But what I don't get is that the last thing we said as we were sitting at their table was that people need to at least provide you the information so you guys, as citizens, can make a decision. So the last thing I asked for was they need to show up to civic clubs, super neighborhoods and to the guy that lived in your neighborhood for 30 years and ask him where does it flood and find the 10 worst neighborhoods and start there amen Take all care. right Lawsuit in the neighborhood, but that didn't 
do anything for them but set them up for false hope. So I try to understand, well, God, what do you want me to do? So I try to follow the system. What happened? How did she fall through the cracks? She's a widow. She looks like she's deathly ill. She has no surviving family members to help her out, and she's on a fixed income. So what I found out is that the people of the city are really fantastic, but she just fell through the cracks because she was honest. She said, the question said, are you renting or do you own a home? And she said, I'm renting because on her fixed income, she had to rent because her home was also being paid for that's yep. owned. Yep. Because she was honest. And she called all these people and couldn't get a live person. And her friends couldn't get a live person. Not from the city, not from the church. Not because we don't have great people helping. We have great people helping. She just fell through the cracks. So when I went to see her, I was like a nightmare scene. Got it home, spilled inside, furniture piled up, tons of mold, and that's why she said she had a choice between being homeless or toxic mold syndrome. And so thank you to the people that have taken her from the bottom priority towards the top priority and are gonna go in and do a risk assessment. But how many other widows are hurting like this? Like we shouldn't have that happen. We have compassion, they just fell through the cracks. And I hope that somehow us stepping up as leaders of the community can make a difference because we will. All these people on this table from my business network volunteered to go meet her and we are now putting her back in the system and we had a private person, a private investor save her home. So she is no longer gonna be homeless, she's a success story. But the next thing is she's gonna get an assessment for toxic mold and health, her health condition because it's it would have taken 48 hours of cleaning out that house that she was stuck in for her not to be ill today. For 30 days she's been sick because we couldn't get her to the job we got for her because nobody cleaned that place and she didn't know. So thank you for your time and I hope we can help people like this. Danny Aspen. So, um, just some suggestions, uh, just for me. Um, I think, just a, like a, we were saying at the table, the city of Houston needs to build according to nature. There are several different agricultural organizations that we know of that can help us with that situation. Also, I believe that areas that are hit hardest, the city should kind of get with uh, the credit bureaus that are out there too, and uh, come up with a point system that they can help us with when things are happening. Communicate with TransUnion, Equifax, and all these other people uh, that control our credit, because things can happen, you know, during disasters and things like that. Also, I think that uh, with the permitting process that's happening, I think that if the city of Houston can extend this arm and give authority to working super neighborhood organizations to pass permits, I think that would help a lot of the situation because the city of Houston is so huge, it seems as though sometimes the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. That's right. So if you have people within the area who know the area and have the best and have a proven record of having the best intention for the area, right, because they live there, then give them the power to permit. So that way it will curtail a lot of the gentrification, a lot of the uh, poorly built homes that contribute to the loss of life and also do more enforcement on uh, illegal dumping and things like that. We team up with an agricultural uh, organization. I, I've heard of one that 
says that it can plant uh, things on top of the garbage and eat the garbage. But you never know that because they're not invited to these meetings. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Rosalind Jackson. I'm on Rob. to give uh, my feedback and uh, capture, capture that in this public hearing. And I just have a couple things to say. I'm a neighbor of Maria's. Uh, in the past five years, we've flooded four times. And uh, when I heard Ms. Roslyn speaking, I, I sort of felt the same way. And uh, any time it rains, uh, I sort of wonder, is the water going to get into my house this time? Um, so. We're not in a floodplain. Um, we know that drainage is a, is a key issue in our area. Um, the city's even come up with a couple of plans, it seems like, to, to address it, but nothing's been done. There you go. So, um, yeah, I, I just, again, wanted to sort of air the, air the grievance. I think that many of us have, uh, have been suffering for the past few years, and um, hopefully, like some of the other projects that have been uh, requested or attention that has been requested here this evening, that uh, our area will be considered as well for this fund. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Where are you from? What neighborhood? Woodcrest area. Woodcrest. Katie Murphy.
rained so hard. That was last year in July, we had a storm. And the drainage was the issue. It's not because I'm in a flood area, it's because the culverts were completely blocked. 70% yeah. blockage. So I was fortunate enough that we had a drainage program or a drainage project over the summer. I have been calling 311 every month, working with Dwight Boykin's office, his chief of staff who knows me by first name now. So the issue that we had in my neighborhood <laughs> with this project, and I'd like to give feedback to everyone who's going to work on a drainage project, the project management was very lacking. So this plan was created five years ago from what I understood. No one came back to reevaluate or look at complaints about the current drainage issues when they started the projects. So even though I had been calling for months and months about this, they came out and there was a section 70% blocked that was causing my area on my side of the street to not drain at all to the point where every room in my house now has cracked drywall that was just replaced a year and a half ago. They did not have that section that was 70% blocked in the plans to replace it. I had to fight with project managers, city inspectors, the company that was contracted to do the work, the foreman on the job called 311, it was a mess. There has to be a better way to manage these projects and reevaluate them at the start of the project not only that, but to let the residents know that a project is beginning. The only sign that was posted in my neighborhood was posted on Yellowstone, facing Yellowstone, east of Calhoun. So the only time you were gonna see it is if you came from MLK on Yellowstone and turned your head. No one in my neighborhood knew about it. In one of the other neighborhoods, neighborhood north of Yellowstone had similar frustration with the fact that no one was notified that a project was starting. So you're talking about neighborhoods that have open ditches and no sidewalks for low-income people who don't necessarily have a vehicle and already are walking on the edge of the street. So in digging the ditches, they're digging them deeper and in a V shape. I understand the water has to go somewhere, but now that little strip that was there for someone to walk on the side of the it's asphalt no is no longer there, which is creating safety hazard, and it's impossible to maintain. So I do my own yard work. I'm 31 years old. I have a very hard time weeding my own ditch. It's impossible. The angle is way too steep. I have elderly neighbors who cannot do their yard work, but we as the homeowners are responsible for maintaining the ditches. So. When we go to make these plans for future projects, there has to be some kind of way to find a better solution to make things less hazardous for the homeowners and the residents of the neighborhood. That is my biggest issue there. Aside from that, the inconsistencies that we found, my driveway is concrete, it was replaced with asphalt. That was another fight I had to have. We had sections that were previously an open ditch that were replaced with drain breaks and paved over. So now there's parking on that side of the street, but it wasn't consistent. It was just in certain spots. And trying to get things fixed and replaced once they started this project was a nightmare. Not only that, but the section that was 70% blocked, they took that out. And instead of taking out the rest, under the cross street there so that it could drain completely to Cullen, they left it there because I didn't complain about that under the street. So it's really not completely draining. They put down sod in my ditch, which was full of water, and I had to smell it rotting until I complained even more. So even the job foremans are not paying attention to what's going on. There has to be more project management on these things. So when we have all these millions of dollars, yeah. This needs to be really managed to make sure that this is being spent properly. Because we're doing ourselves a disservice by making a plan now and then in 2025, assuming that this neighborhood looks exactly like it did right now. So, 
because this is the fourth time that water has gone in, into her home and, and nobody's there to help uh, to get it out. When you get a, a old, right. nobody's going to come help you clean out your house and get your furniture up and all of that kind of stuff. You get the one room cleaned out and you got six or seven more that are all, all wet. So we need to look at the, uh, making certain that we hold those whom we elect accountable for. We need to be more aware. The neighborhood association, the, what do you call it? You baby girl, neighborhood Super the neighborhood. The super neighborhoods work. And the gentleman that was talking about giving them more information, the power to help us, that would work just fine because they're in the community. They know what's going on in the community. And they, that information needs to be taken and given to the city and the county. Our last association meeting, we stress that it's time for the county and the city to stop passing the buck and start working together. I heard a gentleman say a moment ago about how they need to work together. It's going to have to happen because when we were annexed in 1980, all of the city, the city annexed us, but not all of our services. So now we're still fighting over what portion is for the, what part does the county handle and what part does the city handle. They need to both come to the table together and we all can sit down and draw out, get a plan together to get these problems taken care of. The problems would not have been there had we had those in power who with the power had done what they were supposed to do in the first place. But since I don't have time to point my finger because I want it fixed, we just need to get together. The communities get together. Don't stop fighting. Get There is a way to fight. Yeah. Get together, get your game plan together, and present it in a respectable manner and hold these people's feet to the fire. Yours too, precious. Love what it Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Will arrive in our class. Dr. Rosalind Francis. You see how the spirit works? I couldn't look at my paper. You saw all the infrastructure. Yeah, I couldn't put my, my, my eyes. You don't need no mic, baby. Just talk. We can hear you. Go ahead and talk. Just talk. Huh? Let's push you, but let's not speak on her behalf. Okay, the clock is ticking. It's not working. It's on. Hello? Hi, my name is Dr. Francis. I am from um, City Gas, born and raised. Um, I am appalled and I'm just disappointed in the city of Houston. Why? Because my community has been flooded over 35 years. Years. Yes, ma'am. Years, years, years. I am disappointed in how we have been treated in steady gas. Okay? I'm so disappointed. My dad's lungs collapsed two years ago because of the hurricane, because of the flood, because of the, the mold that was invested in the home there. So I am appalled of how the city of Houston has treated city gas, a community of color. We are in need of drainage, a new drainage system. We are in need We are in need of so many things that we need in our community. We are in need. What would it take for the city of Houston to actually fix our infrastructure? What would it take? A community of color, of people. We have always been dis discriminated. For what reasons, we have no idea. So today, tonight, I'm here to say that we need your help, the city of Houston. We need the, our infrastructure space. We need our drainage. We need those things fixed. What would it take for you guys to help us in our community? What would be the, the concerns of the issue? What, 
What plans of action do you have for us to sit down as a community and work these plans together? We're tired. We're tired of being the underdogs. We are tired of this. And so if we can come, if we can come together as a community, as a community as a whole, we can make so many things possible. So that's, that's, my, that's my vision for our community tonight. I would love for us to work together as a community so therefore we'll be able to uplift our infrastructure. We'll be able to be, be able to have our kids have nice bike lines to ride, to ride back and forth home to school. We need these things in our community. And so if you'll be able to help us, we'll be more than happy to accommodate these guys as well. So that's all of our speakers that uh, signed up to speak. Is there anybody additionally? And uh, please speak your name before you invite your comments. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Letitia Grant. I'm first vice president of Acres Home Super Neighborhood. And what I wanted to do was share with everyone something that we found out in our round table. Um, our community, if you're not familiar with Acres Home, we have a large population of seniors. And there is a survey if you are affected by Imelda. Um, we were unaware of it, but we're going to have to help some of our seniors fill this out. And where do you find that? That survey is at recovery.houstontx.gov. And I'll repeat it again. If you <laughs> I'll repeat it again. It's recovery.houstontx.gov. And if you know someone or if you were affected by Imelda, this survey is going to be used to help determine the areas that were most affected, according to the individual that was sitting at our table. But um, it's important that you fill it out. And if others in your community do not have access to the internet, maybe you can share that with them this week. Would anybody else like to speak this evening? Going once, twice. All right, before we wrap up, I first want to thank all of you for coming out on a Tuesday night to hang out with us from 7 to 9. As mentioned before, uh, we're going to be putting our action plan up shortly. Uh, we're developing it. This is a major part of that process. We'll be holding another public hearing. We're taking some time in mid January. But we'll be putting out more info on all of that. So that you guys are aware of it. I want to thank all the staff from the city for coming out and helping with this. Can you get a minute? Can you get a minute, stop by and see them. We'll be hanging out for a little bit longer, so if you have any questions, if there's anything we can do to help right now, let's have those conversations. You guys have a good, safe evening.